I do that sometimes. I'll either like still accidentally have the eraser tool going or I'll be on the wrong layer or the opacity is turned down and I'm like, why is this not drawing? What is happening? And then I'm like, oh, oops. Hello, hello everyone. I'm so glad y'all are here. I hope you're having a great night. It's gonna get even better because we're going to draw together, yay. And the title of this piece is Pression. And the idea is to just kind of embody that heavy feeling of depression that's very similar to the heaviness of water. We did all of this beautifulness and we've been doing a lot of experimentation with textures and blending and it's just so much fun and I'm so excited to get into more of the shading and the detail work and hopefully we're gonna finish this piece tonight. It's not blending out the way I wanted it at all. Okay, the vaccines are being rolled out. We're making good headway. Hopefully that means that we can start to see some progress because it's so crazy that it's almost been a year since all of this started. And I've been kind of thinking about that a lot lately, just, you know, where I was a year ago, what I was doing, what my plans were, all that kind of stuff. I am a little bit on edge tonight um, just because fortunately um, my cat lady, uh, my little princess who likes to make appearances every now and again, um, has not been eating as much as she normally does like for the past week. So of course that's concerning. It's kind of thrown me off a bit. I'm just trying to do what I can for her and see what happens in the meantime. It could be nothing. It could be, you know, the end. I don't really want to think about that, but I just, every time she like moves around or does anything, I'm just like, oh my god, what's happening? <laughs> it's not an easy thing to face. But I am so grateful for all the years that I've had her, and hopefully I will get more time with her. I just, I love her so much. She's such a good girl. She's my baby. Thought about, well, what is that going to look like when I actually have places I can go and people I can hang out with and staying out late partying or going to events or whatever? And the answer to that is, I, I don't know. I will figure it out once we get there, but hopefully by then I'll have had a lot more practice at this whole sleeping and taking care of myself thing that I've been working on. Definitely want to jump back into the convention scene once all is said and done. I greatly miss that. I know my bank account greatly misses that. Selling my, my books and my art on the regular. But most importantly, I, I just, I really miss the experience hanging out with everybody and meeting new people and just being a part of that whole culture. It's just, it's so exciting. It's so alive. It's very inspiring. It just, just makes everything feel real. I miss being a part of the convention world. It just really makes the works that I create feel more real because I actually get to see people interacting with my work. People looking at my art and picking up my books and talking about what they like about it, what inspires them, what they enjoy, all that sort of stuff. Because the books that I released last year in 2020, it just kind of felt like I crossed it off the to-do list and then it was just kind of like, okay, I did that. Cool. Now what do I do with myself? <laughs> Like it just, just felt kind of anticlimactic and like I did all this effort and it was just kind of like nothing. But you get to see what all of your efforts have yielded. So that's that's definitely been a struggle for me this past year. And I think that's also part of why it's been hard for me to be motivated to work on my personal writing projects like my sixth novel. Just because it, it just kind of feels like, well, even if I do finish it, what does it matter? sort of thing. So it just it's hard to combat those feelings and to keep going and keep working on stuff. I've had people tell me, they're like, well, the thing is, is that a lot of these expectations are ones that you put on yourself, that these are all self-inflicted expectations and goals and schedule and all that. And yeah, that's true. Like, 
Technically, all I have to do is like my daily client work. And then once I do that, I could literally just hiss off for the rest of the day and just not do anything. I could just like go back to bed and like sleep the whole rest of the day or just like play video games all day. I could totally do that. But the reason why I don't is because because of all these self-inflicted schedules and, and goals and things that I've I've built around all this stuff and it's not just oh to give myself something to do to keep me busy because there's plenty of less stressful things that I could do to keep myself just busy and having like simple goals like that is really helpful right now and I really suggest creating some simple goals like that for yourselves just you know, a kind of low pressure goal where it's like did the thing hooray working as a creative person is if you're going to work a convention circuit is there's a lot of upfront costs to that. And I learned that trial by fire. <laughs> I learned a lot very quickly. A lot of conventions have you where you have to actually purchase a badge, just like the regular attendees, in addition to purchasing your booth space. Not all conventions do it, but some of them do. And I've, that's always rubbed me the wrong way, but unfortunately it is what it is. And a lot of times you also have to pay extra for like extra tables or chairs or so I began investing in my own furniture, the collapsible tables and all that so that I didn't have to constantly rent from the convention. I could just bring my own stuff and set up and be like, booyah got like three tables, yo, taking up all the room in the world. But then also the cost of, and like depending on what you're selling at the convention, this cost is going to be different for everybody. But there's also the upfront cost of whatever your product is. All the cost of those kinds of materials add up too. And I learned a lot about pricing your products in order to make an actual profit. So not just like, oh, hey, let's say we're just going to pretend land here. Let's say this book costs me $5 a piece when I order it from the wholesaler in order to sell it at this convention. It costs me $5. So I'm going to price it at $7 so I can make a profit. I did that at first, and then I realized, oh, no, we have to raise the price to, it costs, the book costs me $5, but I'm going to price the book at $10, and the reason for that is because we have to factor in the cost of attending the convention and all that fun stuff, so profit has to reflect all these other expenses that are going into the whole process of being able to sell the book in the first place. And not a lot of people think about that, like when they're first starting out. I didn't. I didn't know that. I learned it as I went. <laughs> and just figuring out that line of pricing where it's you need to price it enough so that you can make a profit, but then also make sure that the price isn't too high so that people still want to buy it. So that was that was always game I was playing, not like trying to like have ridiculous prices and price gouge people or anything like that. Like I always tried to keep them as low as I could. But it was it was just interesting to see how all of that works. And in college, I did take some like business classes and like advertising classes and stuff like that. So I had a basic knowledge of all of those concepts, but it's it's just so much different doing it yourself like actually being in the thick of it and figuring it out on your own as opposed to like some exercise you read about in a textbook like it's just it's real life is is never the same as learning something in a classroom all my stuff in my little my little cart <laughs> very important if you work conventions buy a cart is worth the investment like the first investment buy a cart <laughs> lugging in by hands just no just no, <laughs> buy a cart and schlepping all my stuff in and just that, oh, I love that feeling of when you first walk into the dealer room or wherever it is that they've assigned, this is where all the vendors go and you get to your space. That that part is such a great part of the experience where it's like there's so much potential the convention is just starting you're taking stock of the space that you have and figuring out okay how am i going to set up my layout for this so to maximize all my stuff and be appealing to customers and just getting it all set up look pretty like i just i love that part of the process it's it's very fun for me and it just it always got me so motivated and pumped up that like once i finished 
finished getting my booth all set up and I took pictures of its posts on social media and I just kind of stand back and look at my booth and be like, it's so pretty. It's just a really good feeling seeing all your stuff laid out all pretty like that. It's very rewarding. Really common novice mistake that I see people make. Facebook writing groups and stuff like that. People like just starting out or they're like starting to research publishers and stuff like that. Like a lot of people make the mistake burning bridges where like let's say they'll get a rejection from a publisher or an agent or something and then they'll write back something like really stupid in response to the rejection and then they wonder why they're like not getting anywhere with like any agent or like any publisher or anything like that and it's like well everybody in the community talks and now you've kind of shot yourself in the foot so good luck with that and while I am very grateful that I didn't have to learn that the hard way not that I would like I would I don't think it would have ever possessed me to like write back to a publisher like how dare you reject my story like that just seems obnoxious and ridiculous to me but whatever but that was one of the things that I learned when I went to Columbia is they taught us a lot about the publishing world and how to deal with publishers and submission process and all that and they did tell us that it's a small world after all publishers talk and stuff like that but Again, it's one of those things that you kind of have to experience for yourself that, yeah, like they told that to me, okay, it's a small world, everybody knows everybody, whatever, but to like actually see it when you're at a convention and you've seen the same group of people for like the fourth time where it's like fourth convention in a row, like it's the same like 50 people, you're like, whoa, <laughs> like that is, that is very eye-opening to be like, oh, these, these are my peeps. I either need to be friends with them or I am up a creek without a paddle. And politeness goes a long way, but also just letting my personality shine and being the sparkly pink weirdo that I am and all that. Like, people respected me for my ideas and my work and my looks that I do. Because I love dress like this when I would like work conventions, stuff like that. Like I would go in like full cosplay outfits and just have a ball. And a lot of other people do it too, like not just me. I'm just a little bit extra about it. But that just became part of my brand. And, and it was very much to my benefit because after panels, a lot of times people will be like, okay, I'll look for you in the dealer room to come find you and buy your book or whatever. And I'm kind of hard to miss. So it was it was awesome branding in my favor that it's like, yes, I'm the giant pink sparkly person that is impossible to miss in the room. So it was very easy for people post panel to come find me and then be like, I want to buy your book. And I loved that. I loved that so much. And I loved that it was a perfect example of that work speaks for itself. Like obviously, I also acted like polite, reasonable human being too. Like I didn't act like a crazy person, rude or anything like that. Stuff like that matters too. You can't act all snobby and rude and horrible to people. But the fact that it was like, yeah, I'm this giant pink sparkly weirdo, but I am 100% a professional person and I know what I'm doing and I write good quality books and I make good quality art and people totally respected me for that. And I really loved that mission that I could be myself and still be seen as a professional person. I'm really liking this piece so far. I'm really liking how this technique is turning out. All right, let's see. Ooh, it's looking good. <gasps> oh no, y'all. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> oh no, I have made a rookie mistake. I have made a mistake. So this is, this is the ultimate mistake to make, y'all. Drawing the line art over your baseline art. So watch this. This is the baseline art air layer. All that line art I did. <laughs> oh no. Let's see. Hooray, it's fixed. Yay. All right, crisis averted, y'all. That was bleh. <laughs> I, I would write stories as a kid as I just had all these fantastical story ideas in my head and I would just gobble up books, whether from my school library or when my parents would take me to the bookstore and let me pick out books. Sometimes there would be stories that I'm like, I want a story that's like this. And they just did not have it. It just, it wasn't a book. So I was like, okay, fine. I will make it be a book then. 
And I think that's really the job of writers is to create stories that haven't been told yet, create stories that aren't on the shelf yet. You know, that sometimes I'll either like still accidentally have the eraser tool going or I'll be on the wrong layer or the opacity is turned down and I'm like, why is this not drawing? What is happening? And then I'm like, oh, oops, whoopsies. I'm so grateful for y'all tuning in. I will see you all on Thursday. Yay. Thank you so much. Have a great night. Bye-bye.